namo myoho renge kyo, namo myoho renge kyo, namo myoho renge kyo. Thank you so much for being here. I so much appreciate your practice and your dedication. Uh, new subscribers, thank you so much for your subscription and liking videos. Uh, subscribing is a Bodhisattva act because it helps the algorithm spread this resource to help people practice with confidence and free themselves of doubt, yeah? We all need that. So if you're new here, welcome. If you've been here for a while, welcome. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about identification. You hear me use that term all the time. Um, and so I thought it was time I nailed down a definition so we all are on the same page, yeah? All right, identification, a noun. Uh, the three dictionary definitions are kind of obvious. One, the act of identifying. Duh. Two, the state of being identified. That's very important because at the same time, these two definitions, there's a third one, proof or evidence of identity. Wow. Those three all working together in one word, identification. That's so much the core of, um, excuse me, the core of what I do when I talk about identification in Buddhism, yeah? Because the first one, the act of identifying is, this is something we do with our minds, our sentient minds, yeah? But the second one is the state of being identified. Isn't that kind of the reverse direction? Right? You might have thought, yeah, the state of something being identified, but what does it care? I'm identifying it or another person, you might say. But I want you to hear that differently. The state of being identified happens at the same time, just like cause effect, as identifying something. We are at the same time, the other fingers pointing back at ourselves, being identified. This is very important to the way that I'm constantly referring to this term of identification, right? Because this is our, um, the way our skandhas work, right? We've talked about skandhas. Our, our sense uh, fields, organs, uh, work with our brain to create a database of identification. But when we identify something, we are at the very same time identifying ourself because if that's not me then I'm something other than that that that's that push-pull is constantly happening in the mechanism of identification right it's uh, not something we pay that much attention to but that's what we're doing right that's how we come up with memetics like uh, the white picket fence, house, uh, 2.3 kids, uh, the wife, the, the husband, the this, the that, the that. All of these social constructs, they're built around another cliche, who we think we are. We're identifying ourselves constantly by identifying the things in our environment. And as, as Buddhists, we know that that's a fake duality, that we and our environment are co-interpenetrant in our existence, moment to moment to moment to moment. That's tough. When you first start studying Buddhism, that's not obvious. You hear it, you read it, but it doesn't really gel, yeah? All right, so let's get into uh, the entry in the book here. For our purposes, the, quote, act of identification, end quote, is our point of discrimination. Again, a two-way street here. What act is it that identifies, and who is it that is acting? It may be useful to start by exploring what identification means within Buddhism by first stating what it is not. Identification is not labeling or naming. 
as in the Nidana stage of Namarupa, or name and form. It is and it isn't, but what I'm trying to make a distinction of here is that it's easy to say that when we identify something, that's a book, that's a guitar, that's a friend, that's a door, that's my image in the mirror. We confuse again, we confuse words and language with the thing. And more to the point, the act of thinging. Because ultimately, the words we apply, the definitions in the brain that we put together as the data, the warehouse of characteristics, right? the 10 factors, the, all of that is a way of identifying that the, the, the labels, the things, the data isn't the identification. That's where we think the identification is. But we've created all that. It's a construction for our brains to hold on to an identification that is in fact not all of that data but part of what constructs our experience of self, our idea of self. Stay with me now. Identification certainly plays a recognizable role in the Buddhist term of attachment or clinging see attachment. But long before attachments form in our samsaric mind, the naming, the labeling, the data, that's part of our, if we can get all of those little claws around it, then we can possess it mentally. You see? Before that happens, the first instances of time and space of the very initial state and conditions of the earliest universe, the expression of energy prior even to light, which is a release of energy, was the initial expression of formations. See, so we're kind of after the fact. The form is there. We're busy naming it. Naming it. That's all samsara. The formation, the energy taking tendencies and conditions and manifesting what we're naming is where our identification occurs. Because those very same formations are what we're desperately trying to label. And if you think of name and labeling and, I, and thingifying as a mental claw coming out and identifying self with that, that's what's going, that act is identification. And so when I asked earlier, who's doing that identifying, right? Is the guitar doing the identifying? No, it's just there. It's our self that's doing the identifying. And that's how we construct the self, the identifier. Mm. Let's go on. Within formation is an intense and unstoppable kinetic force to instantiate. Because that's what formation is, right? It's the primary distortions and agglomerations of energy becoming. If there was no becoming, if there was no effort, desire to, craving to experience, to be for being, then the formation would just disappear. It would die off and no thing would happen, right? But as the formations lead to being of something, something manifest, then there's a kinetic energy, there's momentum because now it's going to continue to be-ing 
moment to moment to moment to moment. So there's like the whole universe, like your life, like we talk about all the time. We are momentum of this freight train of karma, this these energies and formations becoming manifest. This is the engine of life. Chugga, 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 chugga. Moment to moment, moment to moment. Birthday, 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 birthday. Hmm? This formation, this instantiation energy is not yet defined, quote-unquote, or parametized. It is at this point simply the raw expression of formation, a moving toward an insatiable momentum. Enter the nidana, see nidana. This is the, the primary steps of the nidana before name and form. This is where we identify. Hmm? From the Nidana, we learn the subtle transformations occurring at speeds from the incalculably small to the unknowably large, right? And we go back to Max Planck and his units of time, right? In 12 stages, the Nidana takes energy through the formations of all factors and instantiations of uh, the life of the life, oh, typo, sorry, of the life, karma, sentient being, and extinction, arising, endurance, and disintegration. For our purposes here, we'll focus on the early steps of the Nidana process, yeah? Because that's where identification, it's even in the translations, in some translations, the very word that's used. It's the beginning of the skandhas, right? In the initial process of formations, the inherent kinetic imperative is preeminent. Preeminent. Yeah? It's all about forming. I want, what do, but what do we want to form? How do we want to form it? How do we want to be every single potential that is the universe from particles to rocks to trees to humans to alligators what do we want to experience how do we want to experience that how can we experience that this is again the beginning of the skandhas right we decide or we decide the the energies decide form and think yeah, vision feel how how do we parametize the characteristics of thingifying Samsara, right? This is what, from the other side, Buddha identifies as the factors, right? Appearance, sensations. Hmm? In order to, for those to have any meaning, there needs to be a mind capable of seeing the appearance. Let's make eyeballs, there, right? The Nidana is fascinating. Again, I, I recommend Julie Sivola's book on, uh, uh, what's it called? Um, the uh, Something of Awakening, the, the Doctrine of Awakening. Great book, uh, especially about the Nidana. Really takes it apart. Fascinating. Okay, so let's go on. It is important to understand that this is eventually the same kinetics present in the instantiation of every tiny aspect of karma in our vast amalgam of self, right? That karmic freight train that is contained within the simple word craving. This is, this is what we read in the translations identifying this incredible energy to be, to become, to instantiate. But it almost seems opposite, doesn't it? Because when we think of craving, we think of something we crave to be. I'm not saying that's entirely wrong, but what Buddhism is identifying as craving is the thing itself, the formation to be a thing is the craving. The craving is the, the formations, not you, not me. We come after the fact. 
This is why it's important to study the Nidana. Now, if you're told never read anything other than the Lotus Sutra, you're not. You're going to have a hard time seeing that in the Lotus Sutra because the Lotus Sutra assumes that as a knowledge base, assumes you know. That's not a bad thing. That's how we learn everything, right? We build on top of earlier knowledge. We learn how to speak sentences because we learned the alphabet. When you learn how to make sentences, you don't recite the alphabet every time you open your mouth, right? So I think it's useful to go back and study the Nidana, not because the answers are there, but because it opens the mind to what's to our compassion, which is something we just talked about. What are we compassionate about? What is actually going on in the world, in my life, in yours, right? So craving, not a word we would have thought of, right? You might say, I'm craving something sweet right now. I'm not saying you're wrong, but when you use the word cravings in a Buddhist context, context sorry, we're really talking about the craving of the sweet to exist, to be. Yeah, that's fascinating, isn't it? As well as our own lives and our craving to be. Hmm? In fact, the very energies that amalgamate to form the skandhas, which I've already mentioned, our initial consciousnesses, see skandhas, that's in the book too, are necessary for us to create construct, validate, and experience our cravings as desires. There's the difference between cravings and desires. Desires are more our samsaric mechanisms of having, possessing. But cravings are the other way around, the energies forming to be. Hmm? Desires want, have, possess, cravings to be, to instantiate. You see? Big difference. Most people would use them interchangeably. But as Buddhists, we understand this language of the mechanisms that drive life far more profoundly, right? Okay. Desires being our more relatable context for this huge compendium of kinetic energy, karma, can it be any wonder then the effort required to quell the momentum of cravings while replacing its momentum with insight, hmm? insight so profound as to dislodge the skandhas from their own formations so as to witness them with a second mind. Right, like my uh, uh, canoe in the rapids analogy or kayak in the rapids analogy, right? Where you're going down the rapids and all you can do is try not to get your head smashed against the rock in the panic of the moment, samsara. Whereas if you could just mentally put yourself on the shoreline observing the rapids, now you're secure, you're safe, you're not panicking, you're still experiencing the raw power of the rapids and the implications and so forth, but you're not in danger. You're secure. You're objective. Kind of a second mind, right? Which is, in a way, what we're doing to enlighten our buddhaness. That observer, that observation point of being, of witnessing the very acts we are manifesting from our cravings but without the desires attached to them just observing the mechanisms the engine of life at work hmm? a mind liberated from the tremendous kinetics of the cravings the mind of buddhaness so there it is it may be useful to understand the ninth consciousness of Buddha 
as a second mind, embracing the surrounding, the functional, quote-unquote, mind of samsara. Though both are inherent in the one mind of human beings, as Shakyamuni Tom, in this way we can identify our monkey mind as it scurries about satisfying every craving and while watching from a safe position, unattached of our Buddha mind, see our cravings and that of others as a kind of entertainment or concern and compassion to understand the tremendous engine of life. In this profound and continuous process of life, our samsaric mind also continues the formidable kinetics of craving. Those cravings rely on one thing. That thing is identification. It's right in the first steps of the nidana. As soon as there's identification, there's discrimination. As that's the duality right there. In order to crave, one must know what to crave. And to know is to identify. Once identified, well, one's cravings are not likely to let go. And therefore, clinging. It's a very, very important term in our Buddhist practice. So I encourage you, if this isn't enough information, you're only going to find a limited amount of information online and in dictionaries because those are samsaric tools and they explain language from a very utilitarian standpoint, our samsaric database, warehouse. Don't ever forget that Buddhism extends our understanding of these mechanisms hmm? far more profoundly. But it's in, it's in the language that they can't escape it. So, identification, cool term. Once again, I have to thank you for being here. Thank you for your practice. Thank you for your curiosity. Thank you for your support. Take a moment and like and subscribe. It's not going to cost you anything or do anything. I'm not going to pester you. It's just a way to trigger the algorithms of YouTube to make sure that we're more easily found when people are looking for information on how to remove doubt and secure their practice. That's all this is about. So is the, the uh, threefoldlotus.com website, the bookstore, the ebooks. All of it is to support our practice, right? Give us confidence, increase our resolve. So thank you for your part in that. Um, if you can do more, if you can buy ebooks or uh, print books, um, let me know if there's some area that you're not finding any good resources for that I could add to our resource. That's what this is all about. And those of you who are able to donate through uh, Patreon or PayPal directly, you're making this possible. So. Namo Milodin Gekyo. Thank you so much. You're all bodhisattvas. I respect and appreciate each one of you. So thank you. And in that regard, please take care of your health, right? Keep your practice strong. And be kind. And I'll see you in the next one. All right. Did I? Oh, no frame skips in this one. Woohoo! All right. Take care. See you soon. Bye for now.